So we want to slowly but surely start with the serious stuff uh, and then go deeper and deeper. And hopefully uh, before reading week, I want to I wanna have finished the neural network part um, such that after reading week, we can do other stuff. OK. Today we will have the SVM uh, tutorial. Amir will do that. So since I am doing 100% conventional lecturing just on the board, so I don't have any visualization aid to reinforce the stuff, so tutorial becomes more important because uh, the TAs will show stuff that I cannot write on the board, and I don't want to use laptop. I, it just is not my style. So we'll have some benefit if I show from time to time, but uh, I guess the tutorials are for that purpose. Okay, so let's, let's get serious. So the problem, so when, when we get serious, we always start with the problem. So what is the problem? So the problem is understanding the input, output, input, output relationship. So that's fundamentally what all sciences deal with, but we have some additional, uh, additional challenges. So understanding the input-output relationships, whereas f of x is unknown. Well, if we knew f of x, and x could be a vector, of course, not just a scalar, because then the problem becomes too simple. So if we knew f of x, we wouldn't be here. Nobody knows f of x. So nobody knows that function. There is no equation for it that describes the relationship between in and output if it is about a tough problem. So instead, what we have is data from the past. That's all we have. So you don't know f of x, but you have data from the past. And data can be anything. It can be text, videos, images, numbers, symbols, actions, anything. So which means, again, if you go back to the simplistic world of x and y, two-dimensional coordinate system, and then we do some measurements, So if you do some measurements, then the question is, can you find a function that basically fits the data? So this f of x, which is not actually the f of x that it should be, so therefore we don't call it f of x. Let's say this is f of x hat, so that's an estimate fits the data. How can we find a function that fits the data? Then basically, if you, grab, if you grasp the tendency of the data and I look at it, the problem is we cannot look at the data when it gets hyperdimensional. <laughs> so if I look at it and say, OK, it's, it's going this way. So I see the trend. I can, I can do some statistical magic and get the trend. So I can just go and find the average here and then connect the averages, the simplest, the simplest uh, fit you can possibly come up with. Very simple. As long as you don't have a nonlinear, nasty, non-stationary, complicated, chaotic, outlier-driven, noisy image, you're going to be fine. But all those nasty, nasty stuff usually happens. So we have to deal with that in a different way. So this is an estimate of the unknown of the unknown function f of x so nobody knows f of x <clears throat> okay what is the simpler solution this is, this is not new ai people have not invented that so we have we have solutions for that so a simple solution that has been around for quite some time is, of course, linear regression. 
Yeah, linear regression have, has been along for quite some time. So if you look into the dictionary, to regress means moving backward. Moving backward or reasoning backward. Reasoning backward. So basically, it means learning from the past. And the past is a, has a special place for us. So the past is everything we have in the AI. And we say, as humans, as, as the members of the species Homo sapiens, we learn from the past, which is, of course, not the case. We, we have never learned from the past. Every generation makes the same mistakes again and again in new forms. We never learn. If we would have learned from the past, there would be no war, no poverty, no demolition of environment, nothing. So no violence. Everyone is good because we learned from the past, no? So maybe AI. And maybe this is AI is the projection of that corner, dark corner of the human spirit. OK, we cannot learn from the past. Let's create something that can learn from the past. There you go. You got AI. So, fitting the data, fitting the data from the past, basically you say that my function y is an alpha plus a beta x plus some epsilon. Well, okay. Of course, this is very simple. And this is for us uh, 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 something that should quantify noise. So we add something. As you see here, this is not really a clear curve. So it goes up and down, is, is jittery. So of course, so it, it's some noise. And then we have a linear combination of alpha and beta. So we have a linear combination of this. Addition is a linear combination, right? So I have an ad, a linear combination of two parameters, alpha and beta, which will give me a line or curve that fits into my data from the past. Of course, this is ridiculously simple, but we, we want to understand the basic concept. So, and even that, if you really want to formalize stuff, even that may be too much. So we still simplify it. OK, let, let me simplify it further. And I put epsilon to 0. I assume, I assume I'm in a perfect world. There is no noise. There is no fluctuation like this. So because I want to I wanna come up with a mathematical model. It's about linear regression. Let's say AI has not been invented yet. So I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I have the data from the past. The function is unknown. I want to do something about it. I have, what, what tools do we have? You have to come up with a mathematical model. What is a mathematical model? A set of equations. So then you will get y is alpha plus beta x, which is you are saying, what is the expected value of y given x? And that is alpha plus beta x which we can write cautiously as w sub o plus w sub 1 x. Why? Well, because I want to connect the old and new between the linear regression and the non-linear regression that we will talk about, namely neural networks. Because in the neural networks, we are in love to, work, to use the letter w as the weights. Because if I use alpha and beta, that's, that, that doesn't tell everybody I'm doing something special. So I want to be special. So I, I use uh, delta, uh, I use W, W, O, W, 1. I have some weights. OK, whatever makes you happy. So, so what, what, is, what is then the issue? Now here, we get at the conjunction of history and some of us go this way, some of us go this way. So either you get conventional and 
whatever you try to come up with some equations for it, estimate the equation, or you say, no, I want to go model free. So you can solve this with a model, or you can solve it model free. So let's see. I want to I want to do once once I want to do a model, and then we don't do models anymore because we are AI. <laughs> we don't do models. AI is model free, and when we talk about model again, is set of equations. People people talk about model, they don't know what 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 they mean with model. It's a set of equations. Okay. So, what is intelligence? Intelligence is to find W O and W one. So we have to accept that for the time being. So, but we had that in a model-free way. I'm not writing that. So if you, if you do it in a model-based way, that's not very intelligent because there will be no dynamic adjustment in it. So then we, we write it in a more fancy way. So what is the expected value of WO and W1 given x? Now, I want to formulate it in a different way that I can come up with a model. So what is the expected value of those weights when x is given? What is x? Data from the past. So this is half of the sum of i goes from 1 to capital N, number of measurements, in the bracket, y sub i minus w1 x sub i plus w sub o squared. So, we do not freak out. So, sum of squared, sum of differences. This is, we see this pattern again and again. So, this is my desired output. Of course, I have the data from the past. I have x and I have y. You say, we, we know that from the past. For x1, x2, x3, xn, I get y. Again, that table. So you know what it should be, and you are guessing it. So this is your estimate. So you are estimating it by looking at this and this weights. <clears throat> and of course, I want to see, when I estimate it, am I far off from what it should be? So this is the desired output. This and this, ideally, should, the difference should be zero. If the difference is zero, not just for one measurement, for all measurements. You have a million measurements from the past. You sum them up. Over all of them, the difference should be zero. So you have a perfect fit. Well, that would be fantastic. Can we do that? So if you take this and you now I'm doing conventional modeling, so I need, I need a set of equations. Yes? Yeah. So again, if you are being probabilistic, cautious, and say what you find it not, is not the actual value, it's the expected value, because depending on that x1, x2, y, the table that you have, you get a sample. You don't have the entire population. So what you get are expected values, are not really the mean or the actual numbers that it should be. So this is considering the uncertainty, the imperfection that actually we talked about. So I can just write, what is the error? So I can leave that out and say, what is the error? The error is the difference between desired output and what you calculate as output. So how do we do that when there is no, when there is no AI? What, what do we have, even for AI, not just without AI? 
what can you, how do you know things change? And then how do they change in my favor? So you have to build derivatives. Here in case partial derivatives, because I have two variables. X sub i and y sub i are fixed. They are data from the past. What is supposed to be uh, detected are w over w1. So I have two variables. So with respect to w's, I have to build the partial derivatives and simplify. Now, I don't want to go through that. So if you build the partial derivative with respect to wo and partial derivative respect to w1 and do the magic, simplify, bring this to this side, bring to the, that side, it should not be a big deal to build the derivative of this, right? So the derivative of e with respect to wo and derivative of e with respect to w1. Then this is for me a constant, this is a constant, so I have a power two, I can just build the derivative. It's not a big deal. Don't get scared by the sum. Just, just think it away when you build the derivative. And then after you build the derivative, put it back in. So you do this for fun this weekend. So build the derivative and then simplify it and see whether you get what I get. So after some simplification, you get this. The sum, I, the sum of y sub i is nwo plus W1, the sum of x sub i, is all of, is over i from i equal 1 to n. And you will get for the other derivative, the sum of y sub i, x sub i over i is w o times the sum of x sub i over i plus w1 the sum of x sub i squared over i. So I build the two derivatives, simplify them, bring them here and there. I want to have y and x on one side and everything that has w on the other side. Why? Because everything that we have at disposal is linear algebra. I want to write them in vector and matrix form. I'm after a model, which is a set of equations, and writing it in matrix form will make my life a lot easier. Because I want to come up with a model how to do that. So if I do it this way, which means, so then I want to write the problem in the matrix form, which is A, W is equal Y. And of course, this is a matrix, this is a vector, this is a vector. So I want to write it in that way. That's the reason that I build a derivative. And then I simplify them. I brought y and x, which are constant, on one side, and w's on the other side. OK, now I can put it in matrix form. <clears throat> this is why some AI people don't like too much math which is a dangerous tendency. Because creating a model is a lot of mathematical work. And most of the time, we cannot even do that. So A would be, look at this here. N, W1, uh, sorry, N, the sum of xi, the sum of xi, the sum of xi squared. So N, the sum of xi, the sum of xi, and the sum of xi squared. w, of course, is w o w1, a column matrix. And y is also a column matrix, the sum of y sub i, the sum of y sub i, e sub i, is the other side. So this is y. So then I have my weights, W, O, W, O, W, 1, W, 1, and I have my matrix A. So I, I, I wrote it in terms of a matrix. Why? Well, I want to calculate the model. That line, that curve, has to be estimated for every time that you give me data from the past. Another problem. So I, I'm generating a general model. This is the model. Not exactly. One, one, more, one more thing is missing. How do you get Ws? Well, if I write it this way, 
then W is the inverse of Y times Y. The in inverse of A times Y. That's the solution. Well, life has a structure. Life is good. So simple. Sure. If your problem is behaving, that, that makes us happy. So, somebody says, look, you started with x, and x is of power 1. Is that the reason that you call it linear? OK, OK, what about this? What about y of x is equal w o plus w 1 x plus w 2 x squared? Huh. Now it's not linear anymore. Sorry, it's still linear. It's not about the exponent of the variable. It's about that you're still working with a linear combination of some weights. This is still linear. Forget about this exponent. The exponent has, is a fixed number. My problem is assumed still to be linear. So you can have x cubed and x to power 125. It doesn't matter. If you go with this type of line and you have alpha and beta and gamma, you have w0, w1, w2, w10, you are still a linear model. So if this is still a linear regression, then how do we do nonlinear regression? Nonlinear regression. What is nonlinear regression? So let's take a guess. Do you think face recognition is linear or nonlinear? Of course it's nonlinear. Illumination, change, the way that you are looking, you're smiling, you are crying, you have a baseball cap, is highly nonlinear. Guessing somebody has cancer or not, is it linear or nonlinear? Of course nonlinear. All interesting problems for us, all of them are nonlinear. And the linear regression, with this, this is fantastic. When you see this, you can just walk through the floors with confidence. The world has a structure. I have some matrices. They solve my problems. But my problems are easy. So how do we do this? Well, at the moment, we have a major one. And that's neural networks. So neural networks are nonlinear regression. So if you don't know the f of x, and it's not, the problem is not linear, there is no way you can solve it like this. There is no, there is no matrix formulation for face recognition, for object recognition, for robot navigation, for financial forecast. Not going to happen. All interesting problems are nonlinear. OK. That's OK. That's, that's fine. So we, we, we can start and see what we get and what we do. So go back to history, 1943. My color and pits. They come up with the idea of neural networks. As intelligent machines. As intelligent machines. But what, what, do we know what they are? Not really. So from the raw idea to actually something that we can build, it, it takes decades and centuries. 
1949 have some ideas for rule for learning. How do we learn? If I cannot put my problem in form of matrices and vectors, and then do my magic inverse transform, inverse matrix, and solve it, so that means I have to learn the Ws. And we said that this, learning this, is intelligence. OK, you have to learn something. How do I learn? You learn from the past. You are not a human being. You are an AI agent. You can learn from the past. So a rule for learning, which learning is adjusting the weights. Learning is adjusting the weights. I can, I can go one step further. Intelligence is adjusting the weights when there are no matrices. How do you do that? Our entire mathematics becomes useless for this case. So whatever can, can help me out, it cannot be stupid. 1958, you get Frank Rosenblatt. Now we are talking about supervised learning. Supervised learning, which is perceptron. I don't want to go deeper than that into the history. Many people come. So the idea of Frank Rosenblatt was still raw, but he just hit it. That was it. So take take the model, the neural model of the humans or any central nervous system of any animal, basically, we are not very special, as much as we like to think we are special. Any central nervous system, take the central nervous system of zebra fish. <laughs> you, you, get some, you, you get some insight into that. So there is a building block for learning, and he called it perceptron, perceiving automaton. So perceptron. So he did his PhD on this. And this is the first time you see people draw biological diagrams and figures and use underneath some equations. Oh, that was, that was insane. That was insane. Yeah. These, are, these are things, you know, that if, if you are in AI and it's Sunday morning and you're bored and you say, let's go back and read the PhD thesis of Frank Rosenblatt. This is the sort of thing that you do. Because you read that and say, oh my god, how many years ahead of their time were these people? How, how did they do that? How can you think outside of the box? So everybody runs after deep networks. They say, oh, let's do shallow network. Who does that? Nobody. We always go with the flow. We always go with the majority. These guys did not go with majority. The majority was doing this. OK. Good. So one of the things that these guys did, they, they tried to look at, they tried to look at So they say, OK, let's, let's go back and look at a look at the neuron. Because we, by then, we knew that a neuron is the building block of the central nervous system. So if this is a neuron, and so this is the cell body, and we have The nuclei, nucleus, or nuclei of all of them. And then when we leave, we call these guys 
dendrites, which are the inputs into the neuron. So they bring in electrochemical signals into the cell body. And then this guy is a special one, which is an axon, which is basically the output of the neuron. And then a lot happens. When you look at the axon, you see that there is the axon splits in many, many, many uh, splits, what we call arborization. Arborization. So this signal gets split, and you give the same signal to many others, to many other neurons. And you also get many, many inputs from other neurons. Of course, this is a very simplistic image that I'm drawing. Please do not take it too seriously. This is still an abstraction. And then, what is the magic of a neuron as a special type of cell in the, in the brain of any animal, including the homo sapien animal? So you see that there is axon from other neurons. Axon from other neuron. And this axon comes and has also arborization. And then something magical happens. So then you get a synapse. So where the axon connection of a neuron gets connected to the dendrite of other neuron. And this synapse is what we, in AI, we usually use W to model that. So that synapse, so between, this, between these connections, a lot of electrochemical processes happens. We have some understanding of most of it. Some of it we don't understand, but we know that this magical, if the synapse is strong enough, a signal goes through. So we say that neuron is working in excitatory mode. It, the neuron is excited. That connection is excited. If it is not strong enough, then it will inhibit the signal. Then we say the neuron or that connection is in inhibitory mode. No signal is getting through. Now, of course, I have a synapse here. I have one here, 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 one here. So I can go crazy. One here, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. And I have one here, 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 one here. And this is a kindergarten diagram of the actual neuron. So imagine those synapses to be light bulbs. And you have a million of this stuff. A million? Imagine you have 100 neurons. And you connect every neuron to other neuron. And the synapses are modeled with light bulbs. And now let them then turn off, turn on. Well, magic starts to happen. So you can encode a lot of information. How much? Well, intelligence is changing the synopsis. Now, this is not AI anymore. Now this is neuroscience. And therefore, I don't go deeper because I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm just a, some amalgamation between an engineer and a computer scientist. So I'm not a neuroscientist. The little I have learned is enough for me to develop a good understanding of the abstraction. 
that we use in computer science. So, okay, so it could be in ex excited mode, send the signal, the light bulb is on, or in the inhabited mode, no signal, the light bulb is off. And there are many light bulbs. So imagine you do zero and one. Light bulb off is zero, light bulb on is one. Put that, put that in, a, in a vector or in a matrix or in a tensor. How many possibilities can you encode? Things get interesting. How many neurons? How many neurons? Let's look at two examples. Zebrafish. Well, around 250,000. 250,000 neurons. What about your, your I guess it's fair to say that we are the most egoistic species on the planet. So what about humans? Well, adult humans, because kids and young people still grow. And we didn't know even up to, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, that the brain development does not stop until you are 24, 25. <laughs> Which puts many things in question. So is, is the, can we call somebody with 18 adult? I don't think so. Not according to neuroscientists. <laughs> but what I, I don't want to put that on young people because then you cannot drink beer until you are 24. So, <laughs> so what, about, what about adult humans? We have around 10 to 10 to 10 to 12 neurons in our brain. So and you hear different numbers because it's all based on estimates, 80 million to 100 million. Sorry, 80 billion to 100 billion neurons. So is that it? Is that, is that, that we, so I have 10 to 10 neurons in my brain and that's why I, I have the deceit to say that I'm an intelligent being? It doesn't look like it. It's not about number of neurons. But more importantly, we have 10 to 14 connections or synapses. Because the number of neurons is one thing, Number of synapses is the number of connections between neurons. So you have 10 to 40, you have way more synapses than you have neurons. Okay. Synapses that increase the potential Increase the potential, what potential? What do you think? Electrical potential. So increase the potential or in the excitatory mode or state. And synopsis that decrease the potential decrease the potential or in inhibitory inhibitory mode or state. So again, light bulbs on or off. And apparently the number of the interconnectedness of neuron is what makes the brain a powerful machine. Machine is an insult actually. Machines are stupid. Machines have been around for 100, I don't know, maybe the simple one, mechanical one, what? 400 years, 2,000 years, whatever. 
the central nervous system has been around for at least 3 billion years. So it's not a comparison. So we do not insult the evolution by calling the brain a machine. Good. So, One thing we know from neuroscience is that the synaptic networks are plastic. The synaptic networks are plastic. This we didn't know. Even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, most people, you go to psychologists and say, I have a problem with some people, I don't know, I'm depressed, something, anything. I said, sit down, tell me about your dad. Did your dad ever say he loves you? <laughs> so you would go back and say, okay, so it's too late. Your, your personality has shaped. You cannot change anymore. So we seriously thought in psychology that with six years, when I'm six years old, that's done. That's a done deal. My personality is shaped. Well, neuroscience is nonsense. You can change if you're 92 years old. You just don't want to change. This is what neuroscience is telling us. Because the synaptic networks in human brain are plastic. They can change. It becomes harder. It's easier to learn memorize stuff when you are 10, and it becomes much more difficult in my age, but it's still it is possible. You know, so I'm smoking since 40 years. I don't want to give up. I, I'm just used to it. Get over it. You can do it if you want. You just don't want to change because change is not convenient. And also in AI, change is not convenient. I need GPU, I need design, I need TensorFlow. Change is never easy, but you can change. Yes? Plastic. No, plastic. <laughs> this is not my term. It's come from neuroscience. It's plasticity. So things are plastic, which means they can change. Not, not this plastic, I don't know. So plasticity is the most, I guess it comes, it comes from, uh, it comes from neoplasm. And plasm is the new material that shapes in human body when cells uh, reproduce themselves. And that plastic is with not this plastic, the plastic that is born and can change and is flexible and has mitosis and meiosis and all that. So the, the plasticity is the most obvious manifestation of intelligence. If, 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 if you want to really nail it down and say, OK, tell me really what is intelligence? Plasticity. What does that supposed to mean? That you can change. So does it mean I'm not changing so I'm an idiot? Most likely. <laughs> According to neuroscience, that's not an insult. That's a scientific fact. If you say I'm used to it, I, I just, uh, otherwise, uh, the other favor arguments, I just like it. What do you mean you just like it? If, if you are not willing to give up something. So if I have a, some sort of network, let me see. I can draw some sort of random network. Let's say this is, let's say this is a sub-network in the human brain. And I will try to redraw this. It's something random that I did. So it may be a bit difficult exactly draw that. So the same network. 
And then you learn, oh my god, this is so nice to smoke. <laughs> it's it, it, it just a lot of pleasure when you are upset, when you are happy, when you drink something, when you eat something, it, it, you name it. So every time is a lot of pleasure to smoke. So, and then it gets encoded. So our mind get conditioned. And everything is physiological. We can put it, this is this hormone, this is that hormone. We may not be able to pinpoint this exactly, but in functional MRI and other type of imaging, we can show that this type of brain is active when you do this. We cannot really draw this type of sub-circuits yet. Then you get serious with life and say, come on, get serious. Get some patches, something. And then you do some serious thinking and say, no, no, OK, no, I'm, I'm 35 years old. I'm just destroying myself. So no is garbage to smoke. So same network, but you reprogram it. Literally, you reprogram it. What did change? The synaptic conditions. And one thing that human brain does, which is very sneaky, in a spirituality they call it self-ego. It's very sneaky. So whatever you like, you, there is something that we call it myelin sheath. So you, you wrap protective material around this such that nobody can come and randomly change this network because I like to smoke. I'm, I'm intentionally taking the smoker example because people say, oh, that's an addiction. What do you think addictions are? I'm not talking about the ones that are genetically uh, conditioned and people cannot do anything about it. So if you put myelin sheet around the connection, it gets almost impossible to change them. It takes additional effort to get rid of the protective layer first and then try to change the value of the connections to this and say, smoking good, smoking bad. But neuroscience is telling us you can do it. Virtually for everything, virtually for everything. Anything, any trait, any attribute, any feature, any way of life, any style, you can change it. And if you can do it, so. People who change constantly, we have actually a bad image of people who change constantly. They say, this guy just goes with the wind. Any, anywhere the wind comes, he goes there. Maybe he's a smart guy. Adjust it himself to the circumstances. So here, the same network can exhibit the same network can exhibit different subgraphs of connections. So these are the red ones that I drew. Of course, this is a made up example. Of course, it's not that simple. Of course, it, things are much more complicated. Of course, the network that is responsible for smoking is much bigger than that and infers knowledge from the other parts of the brain and gets reinforced through other habits and so on and so on, yes. But this happens and this is what we call conditioning of the mind. So our mind gets conditioned, programmed to behave in a certain way. And it's, it's, it's common sense that if you behave in that way and do not change, even if you see the the damage of it, this can hardly be called intelligent behavior. OK. Sometimes we have to do this. Because while you say artificial intelligence, how do you can talk about the artificial version of it if you don't have a basic understanding of intelligence itself? So now we have an objective measure. I'm not talking about this nonsense of IQ measuring. You go to a website, you answer 20 questions, and it says, your IQ is 132. So and then that night you sleep well. We say, oh my god, I'm so smart. <laughs> of course, it's nonsense. You cannot measure intelligence. What they measure is some cognitive capabilities. 
Nobody can measure it. The mere fact to attempt to measure intelligence is a stupidity. <laughs> okay. To assume that intelligence is so simple that with two, 20 questions, you get it. And say, okay, this is this. Cognitive capabilities are not intelligence. Or part of it, contribute to it, or some manifestation of intelligence, but they are not intelligence. Okay. Tangent, but, but important, but necessary. Because you want to go with open eyes. Okay, so got it, got it. So neurons are important, synapses are important, excited, inhibited, signal goes, signal doesn't go. Okay, back to AI. What can I do with it? Well, you need an abstraction of neurons. If neurons are the building block of our central nervous system, and we assume adjusting the synapses constitute intelligence, how can I bring that into the computer? How can I bring up with, a, with an abstraction, a computer model of the neuron? So we said that, of course, you will get some inputs. And, and these inputs are generally synapses from other neurons, from other neurons. So most of the time, could be that some neurons directly take input from the sensory information. You touch something, you see something, you smell something, and that's direct input. But absolute majority of them take input from other neurons, so the processed signal. So this input goes in into some abstract model that we have no idea how it looks like, and somehow you have to accumulate Accumulate the signal, the signals. All of them are signals. Somehow it goes inside that, that simplistic picture that I drew from a neuron. Many connections come from the axons of other neurons. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of connections go inside a neuron. So you have to just take them in, accumulate them somehow, all that information. This is excitatory, excitatory, inhibitory, excitatory. And many of them are firing, as we say, which means they are on. And so if I accumulate stuff, the basic engineering principle with me, I, I cannot say. Even if each of the synapses, if any connection comes with 0 0.001 milliampere, or even, I don't know, one microampere, and you accumulate that, oh, that can explode. How much signal can you get? So you need some sort of limiter. All those signal comes. If I'm, if I'm connected to 10,000 others that send me signal, and I just ac accept them, I have to be selective at some point. I say, you know, guys, I cannot take more than this. And then if 100 more come and knock on my door, I don't care because I already got the signal that I wanted. And then something goes out, which is the output, which, of course, this output will go to other neurons. Well, we came up with this, and we said, OK, you know what? Our input is x1, x2, x3, up to xn. They come and go inside, go approach a neuron, and each one of them has a synopsis. Each one of them has a synopsis, W1, W2, W3, Wn. And then we just add everything. What else can I do? Signals come in, I can add them, because you're just giving to me 2 milliampere, 4 milliampere, 6 milliampere, 8 milliampere. OK, I'm just adding them up. And then I need some sort of limiter Let's say, I don't know, something like this, a function like this, a sigmoidal function. So a function that limits the input. So let's say it limits them. When we say limit, so the limit is here. So even if you send me a million other signals, I cannot, it cannot go beyond that. So which means every neuron has a saturation level. 
So by the 500 signal, I'm saturated. And I will fire because I get enough signals from others to fire. So, and then something comes out. Why? Yes. No, this is our logistic function. Sometimes we call it logistic function, sometimes we call it activation function. Logistic or activation function. So the logistic or activation function is a limiter, is a threshold. So I add them up, but then at some level I say, that's enough. I cannot take anymore. Otherwise, everything has a capacity. The hard disk is full at some point. So everything has a capacity. Something has to give. So when I get enough, just I fire. So I send a signal and say, guys, I get enough. My light is on. OK. So it's crucial that even though simplistic, we understand the abstraction. Because if you don't understand the abstraction, it will be really difficult then to follow up with the older, a little bit of mathematics that will come. So let's call this a perceptron. So a perceptron is the most basic learning machine. Now, this is in the computer. I can call it a machine. It's not in the human brain anymore. So it's, it's my abstraction. I can write a Python function for this. Function neuron inputs weights, sum them up, send them to the sigmoidal function, get the output. Big deal. But it can do magic. If you put many of them, because we are imitating something sophisticated, something majestic, result of millions of years of, of evolution. So in the perceptron, the logistic function, the logistic function is a Hard limiter. For example, or, or in general, it is basically a threshold. It's a threshold. You say if the sum of electrical signals that come in exceeds this limit, that's a stop. Don't add them up anymore. That, uh, don't add them up, but I will not send out more than this. <clears throat> So, which means the sum is the sum of wi xi i equal 1 to m, to n here. So, this n. So, take the inputs, multiply them with the weights, and just sum them up. So, I'm here. So, this s, my, my s is this sum. So, and again, synapses could be inhibitory or excitatory. If they are inhibitory, they go towards zero. So zero times x1 is zero, nothing happens. If they are excitatory, let's go, they go toward one, and they let x1 to go through. Simplistic, but that's the basic principle. Now, however, things may get still out of hand, so maybe, maybe, I add a bias here. So my, maybe I equip every processing unit with a bias that says, whatever comes in, you add it plus bias. It may be too early to talk about this, but I guess all of us, we understand that this is a line, isn't it? That's a line, right? W1 times x1 plus W2 times x2 is a line. If you don't give it a bias, that line will go through 0, 0. You cannot shift it around. So the bias 
give me the possibility to draw the line in many different places. OK. Well, this is a line. Which, in, in general, that's it. In general, it's really wrong to say that's a line, but that's a hyperplane. That's a plane in n dimensions because I have n inputs. So that's a hyperplane. Hence, The perceptron, the perceptron can separate two classes. We don't even know how the perceptron learns. How would, how would this weird looking abstraction even work? But when I write my summation, I know that this will be a hyperplane. So which means, so if, if this is my simplistic x and y axis, so then you will have the line like this. So this will be one class. So for example, for wtx greater or equal 0, and this side for w transport x transpose x small equal 0. So if I draw a line, this is one class, this is one class. Well, SVM did that. When Perceptron was born, there was no SVM. So we are going in reverse historical direction. So if I draw a line, and the bias give me the possibility to move it around, so we can play with the slope, we can shift it around, so you have the possibility to learn and say, these are the classes of circles, whatever the circle means. And these are the, uh, the classes of triangles. So I can separate them. And they are, well, they are linearly separable, which means you can separate them with a line or hyperplane. So if, if we have any doubt that this, this sum will span a hyperplane, we have, we have to do some homework if you don't get this. Because then everything else we say is based on this, and things will get progressively complicated. When, we, when I put two of this together, 10 of this together, a million of this together, then I have to realize, OK, what's happening? What, what's going on? OK. So this is what we call the decision boundary. You hear people saying that all the time. This is my decision boundary. So if you have a decision boundary, you know this side of the line is this, this side of the line is this. Cancer, healthy. I hope it was that simple. It's not. But that's just a perceptron. You're just getting started, so let's, let's stick with. So which is w1x1 plus w2x2 plus a bias is 0. So this is my decision boundary. And I have to find w1 and w2 given the bias. And SVM just did that nicely and elegantly and give me the guarantee. And OK, well, that was 1995. We are still in 1945. So for simplicity, we can say, you know what? XO is plus 1, and WO is the bias. 
such that I can write things in a simpler way and say my sum is actually the sum of xi wi or other way around, doesn't matter. So this is more convenient. So you usually don't see that you write the bias separately because the first one we say, okay, that the input is one, the input is one, and then the bias is a certain number. You initialize it, you go. So we never write this because then the things that you want to do, things get nasty. Again, for mathematical convenience, we just work with this and say XO and WO are my biases, the first one. <clears throat> you, have to you have to incorporate that in your, in your implementation, of course. Okay. So how far can we get today? We are getting closer to interesting stuff. But we are not there yet. So now we have to, now we have to iterate over the data, over the data. So S of n is equal the sum of wi of n times xi of n. And i goes from 0 to m, let's say the number of, the number of instances. n is the number of iterations. Number of iterations. Now I'm learning. Now I'm learning. So which of course I can write it as W transposed at n times x at, at n. Now this is a matrix, this is a vector. Who said I should give up those nice matrix operations? I still use them, but I will not build a mathematical model. I use them for local operations, to have nice, uh, efficient implementation. So that's a vector notation, of course. Now, again, if I have, if I have a class like this, so the world is easy because I can do this. So linearly separable. Linearly separable. The world can get nasty when I get this. Any way you draw the line, you have a mistake. So this is a non linearly separable, which means what? If you have an easy problem, you can use the perceptron. If you have a difficult problem, doesn't matter how you play with this line, shift it around, draw it this way, that way, you always get some error. You cannot push the error towards zero. It's not a matter of adjustment of the synapses or the weights. The problem is more difficult than your solution capability. <laughs> so we also could say here, uh, maybe first time that I use this word cautiously, actually you are underfitting. So the problem is more complicated than you imagined. Most of the time you are worried about overfitting, but sometimes you are underfitting. Okay. What about the weight adjustment? Now, this is the entire intelligence we said. How do you adjust the weights? That's all there is to it. 
So let's say x of n correctly classified by Wn. And I'm, again, I'm, I'm giving up the vector matrix notation. We just figured out from the context whether I'm talking about a vector, matrix, a scalar. So we say that W of n plus 1, it will be W of n if W transposed times x of n greater than 0 and x of n belongs to ci. So no change since classification correct. So if the classification is correct, why should I change stuff? If I'm here, why should I change stuff? If I'm here, I have to change stuff. So if I'm making a mistake, I will change it. I should not touch the weights, the synopsis, if they are delivering the right action. So the weight for the next iteration will be the same weight, nothing changes, if this is my boundary and it is correct. Yes? Well, we, have, we are doing a binary classification. The label is implied, 0 or 1. So we don't, so I, I can do that, repeat that for less than 0, negative, the same thing. So we don't, we don't change it if this is the case. Your boundary decision is this. You can also say this, and xn belongs to the ci or c sub j, which means negative or positive, you are doing the right decision. So either you are on this side or you are on this side. No change. The world is good. No change. So if misclassified, Now suddenly I have a triangle here. If, if, if I have a misclassification, then I have to do something about it. If misclassified, then the w n plus 1 is w n minus a learning rate eta as a function of my iteration times x of n for the case that I'm misclassifying somehow. So we call this generally a learning rate. So can I, can I adjust the weight somehow? Don't, don't worry about the uh, positive and negative at the moment. So I misclassified, I should get punished, let's say. So that means the weight that I have was not a good, good enough. The new weight has to be the previous weight plus or minus something as contribution of the input. Why input? What else do you have? Do you have something else I don't know about? You just work with whatever you have. So. If we don't have a misclassification, we, we talk about this so much you will puke. So don't be afraid that we don't understand everything at the moment. Because this is just perceptron. Then we get to multi-layer perceptrons, and then we talk about backpropagation, and then we get to autoencoder, we talk about backpropagation. We revisit it again and again. So if, if correct decision, no change. If misclassification, then I have to do some change. At the moment, I take a weighted uh, subtraction of my input value as my adjustment. 
Who said this is the right thing to do? I don't worry about it. Things that fire together, wire together, Hep told us. But we still don't understand what he meant with it, but OK. We, we will get him. We will get him when we get to back propagation. He was a smart guy. So if the eta of n is a, a positive eta, is a positive value, then we have a fixed increment adaptation. However, Eta is actually is not very important. It's just a factor. It's not a weight. Even if you change it during every iteration, it's not a major factor in the learning process. As long as it's positive. So as long as the eta, which is a factor that we invented, we made it up. So as long as it's positive, what does it do? It, what does it do? It just scales the contribution. That's it. So you may need a little bit more or less, but this is just scaling the contribution. So it's not a gigantically important factor, but it helps. We have it in the learning, and we work with it. So the perceptron can be proven to converge for eta equal 1. So if you set eta equal 1, we can prove that this will converge and do the same job as linear regression with matrices, if you have a problem that you can compare. Most problems that we do with perceptrons are actually a little bit more difficult than the ones with matrices. But both of them do linear stuff, so we can compare them. So if I put eta equal 1, I can prove that this can learn, this can learn a line. But we already did that with linear regression. Be patient. So as the prelude to next lecture, which by the way will not be next Tuesday. Next Tuesday we have a long uh, tutorial, and then the next Thursday we have a long lecture. Because next Tuesday I'm away. So artificial neural networks, we can basically classify them into the ones who take binary inputs and the ones who take real valued, real valued inputs. The ones who take binary inputs, we have supervised and we have unsupervised. The supervised binary ones are, for example, Hopfield nets. Hopfield nets. Or Hamming nets. We will not talk about them because we don't have time. And their performance is relatively limited because we don't have many examples in reality with binary inputs. 
unsupervised with binary inputs, Carpenter, Grossberg, Nat, as an example. So networks that you don't hear much about them. Again, because the input is binary, how many engineering real world applications do I have that the inputs are binary? Usually we get just real numbers. So the interesting stuff happen here. Again, we have supervised and unsupervised. In the supervised category of real valued networks, we have perceptron, we have multi-layer perceptron or MLP, we have CNN, and we have autoencoders AE. Here in the category of unsupervised learning with real valued, we have the lonely fighter SOM. I like SOM. I just like people who fight alone. So we don't talk about this stuff. Although we could go back and talk about Hopfield nets for, for certain tasks, but we mainly are here. We talk about this one. We started to talk about perceptron. We will continue with MLP, CNN, and AA, which is MLP is shallow learning, and then CNN and autoencoders are deep learning. So we will talk about that. Not next Tuesday. Again, next Tuesday will be a long uh, tutorial, and we are planning for that. And then Thursday, I will use the tutorial time to do Maybe we do MLP and we get to the deep learning. I don't know. But we will take a break for, the, for both of them because they are long, uh, long events. So see you next week.